Happy Bringling! We at Bringle team would like to welcome all the participants at Bringle Blended Meetups platform and request everybody to watch it live every day on our YouTube channel Bringle Talks. Just a quick recap on Pulse of Wisdom from the last live session on lean methodology and waste elimination. John from Singapore stressed upon lean methodology is all about increasing the customer value. Lean is the end-to-end -end management system which covers entire gamut of the business. Lean education is going to be the future of various industries. Kuldeep Chawla spoke about waste of talent is going to be the major concern for the organizations. He talked about error-free delivery to customer just on time. He also mentioned that lean process is a habit and culture instead of a project. Anshav Jain, founder of Bringle, talked about changing business scenarios from cash burn model to unit economics, which itself is a start of any lean deployment. He talked about quality is all about setting a right culture, better visual controls and importance on first time right delivery and quality check itself being a biggest waste in the organization. Do keep watching the live YouTube channel Bringle Talks. Subscribe and hit the bell for the other topics on cross border hashtag 21 days business sustainability challenge. And next one is going to be Six Sigma DMAC methodology. Do upload your pitch decks at www.bringleacademy.com slash course slash business sustainability to participate in the week long live pitching to our global investors community. Keep bringling, keep growing. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Happy Bringling. Today we have a very special day. We are going to talk about my favorite subject, Lean. We at Bringle team, along with Solworks, Poonam Foundation and Women Lines, would like to welcome all the participants who are there with us in this Zoom call and are also watching us live at our YouTube channel, Bringle Talks. Just a quick recap as what were the pearls of wisdom from our yesterday's speaker on process innovation. We had a very interesting uh, week start yesterday with Smita gave a wonderful story and the highlight that we should understand what we are doing before we take any innovation and changes in the organization. She brought up beautifully the people focus while driving the process excellence. Dr. Hari have got international, national and local scenarios and brought up various businesses right from education industry to e-commerce to even a normal IT industry before we can take, you know, and he spoke about how we can back up to gear up for the post COVID scenario and give ample opportunities in the various industries. In coming times, we are going to get more jobs because of the right processes. In fact, post COVID scenario, India is going to get more and more manufacturing sector being developed. And there are a lot of services and job requirements will be coming. And that's a very positive news from, uh, from him, which he has explained and very beautifully explained. Anil Patel, who was uh, you know joining us from UK, he very categorically explained about the processes, how it can be even used in a technology world. He being a solution architect, how we can do by doing the best, by designing the right business processes as per the customer demands, and it has to be on an ongoing perspective. Dr. Rakesh Gupta says product and process innovation goes hand in hand. He says India is going to be the market with our quality at Chinese price. And that's a very interesting uh, uh, point which he has brought up. Uh, Ram Mohan has a wonderful view in the process innovation, which is out of the box. He cited few examples of how we can generate multiple revenue channels that can be different than the services. He talked about innovation, vision, good ideas and culture, how it can go hand in hand. He also advised to create a, a complete ecosystem around it with a lot of processes and right set uh, you know, right structure being in place. 
Now, today's topic of cross-border 21 days business sustainability challenge is going to be lean modeling and waste elimination. And before I request Charu to introduce the speakers for today, I would like to request all the businesses, startups, entrepreneurs to please upload their pitch decks at www.bringalacademy.com slash course slash business sustainability with their pitch decks so that we can select your startup for the life pitching week starting 27th of April in front of our cross-border investors. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks, uh, uh, Charu. With, with this, kindly please introduce the speaker. Thank you so much, Asha. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to whole global community there. Myself, Charu Mehrotra, founder of online magazine WomenLives.com, which is listed in top 40 women's online magazine to follow in 2020. It's such a pleasure to welcome speakers in the panel. The topic for today is lean modeling and waste elimination. We have John S. Hamilton from Singapore. He is innovation and transformation leader. John S. Hamilton is a change catalyst with over 20 years of experience at General Motors, Dell, and his own business, specializing in innovation, change, and transformation, digital age management, strategy, organizational development, and lean agile design thinking. With assignments based in USA, China, Korea, India, and Singapore, he has held two Asia Pacific director positions. Holding an MBA, John coaches and trains organizations on how to innovate and transform and is a lecturer at various institutions. He's also a published writer on management and an active speaker at global conferences. Welcome John to the show. Then we have Kuldeep Chavla from India. He's an educator, business excellence, consultant, mentor and advisor. With 30 plus years of a professional experience in IT, BPM and manufacturing organizations, experienced in designing, implementation, and adoption of various process transformation initiatives across various domains and business entities of varied size and scale. He has experience with customers in US, Europe, in banking, retirement, in insurance, manufacturing verticals. Welcome Kuldeep to the show. I hand over to Aisha to take it further. Thank you so much, Charu, uh, for the introduction. Uh, John, I would like to understand uh, from you uh, uh, first, in terms of how, what is lean and how it kind of differentiate from Six Sigma processes. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, how much time do we have for that one? <laughs> Uh, John, you have enough time. Joking. You have enough time. Don't worry. So we can. Yeah, that's talk. that's a. Um, the, I guess the short answer. Um, we could we could talk for a long time on the difference between lean and six sigma, but we can say that lean places a uh, a heavy focus on uh, customer value. So while we do talk about waste elimination. Um, we always want to do the waste elimination only in the context of increasing or at least maintaining customer value. Uh, and that's a step that often gets um, skipped because um, we, we want to cut the waste uh, so rapidly and we jump into starting to cut this, cut that. Um, and sometimes we miss that first step is who is the customer? Uh, what do they value? And what problem are we trying to solve for the customer? Um, and then we would use lean, all kinds of lean techniques, which range from uh, strategy techniques, Hosh and Connery, to uh, process improvement techniques, to even daily management. Um, so lean, lean is probably the only thing out there. And, and Six Sigma is an awesome, uh, is an awesome application as well. But Lean is probably the only thing out there that's a full management system. Everything from strategy to designing processes to managing day to day to people development to even leadership behavior. Um, so um, if you do, um, you know, kind of really deeply embrace Lean, um, it's, a, it's a great part of a successful um, business journey, I think. 
Okay. I think that's a very interesting thing. And uh, the way we have seen is uh, because we have lean topic as of today and tomorrow we are talking on Six Sigma. So uh, the way what we have understood uh, in, in, the, in the organizations is that lean basically attacks the waste and Six Sigma attacks the variation. Uh, now, John, I think uh, I am also trying to understand that is there any specific case study which you can share it from the services sector, which could be more interesting uh, from the lean deployment perspective or a lean transformation? I mean, specifically in the services domain. Yeah, uh, in general, uh, that's a great question. Yeah, um, you know, one, one of the great, um, just as far as books go that have a lot of examples, um, the original Toyota Way is still one of the best books out there, um, but it was a little bit um, focused uh, on manufacturing. So Jeff Liker um, pretty recently refreshed the Toyota Way, plus he also made it for service um, companies. So it's called the Toyota Way to Service Excellence. And the whole book is all service oriented. So it's, it's really awesome. Um, and then the other part, a little bit more specific, uh, I'm part of the Lean Global Network. So every year we have um, an annual meeting. Um, and last year, uh, last year was in Brazil, and it, which was some great service uh, IT companies um, using Lean, Agile, one in, one in Brazil. It's a small app um, software company um, called CINT. They're using lean, agile, design thinking seamlessly um, in, in, in applications we're now starting to call lean digital. So how do you apply lean thinking in the digital virtual space? Um, and another area to share is the year before that, we got a chance to see, uh, there was a, there's a book that you can get now. It's a small book, it's called The Lean Bakery. And it is all about lean F&B. So that's a great services area that I want to explore more here in Singapore because we're so F and B oriented. And this cafe slash bakery, about a hundred stores in Barcelona, applied lean thinking to their whole, not only the operation, but their support departments, the whole company um, with, with a lot of success. And then we also stayed um, also in Spain, but in the Canary Islands, there's a lean hotel, <laughs> if you can believe it. <laughs> where everyone at every level on a daily basis is working on Kaizen. We, we even got a chance to see uh, these chefs. The chefs were actually working on their, on their cooking process. You go to the bar and the bartenders are working on how they can improve their processes. You go to the housekeeping and the housekeepers are working on 5S workplace organization standard work to improve their work. And at the higher levels, they're working on you know, more bigger innovation type things. Um, and of course, uh, insurance, also in Brazil, we, we saw a finance company and an insurance company, uh, all using lean thinking end to end, up and down their whole organization, again, with, uh, with great results. So serv for services, for example, me that, that I grew up in manufacturing, but I haven't been, I left General Motors quite a number of years ago. Last assignment was in India, actually. And uh, all I do now is services, very, very little manufacturing for, for us, for me. And that's true of a lot of the lean community now. Okay. So that's really wonderful, John. And I think the way you are explaining about uh, applications of lean in IT, the digital world, the applications of that in the FNB sector. And uh, I have seen a lot of applications now, I think in the travel sector as well, like a lot of airlines have cut down their cost and try to make it more leaner. And uh, even not only from the operations perspective, but also there from the pricing uh, standpoint in terms of their cost cutting, what is required, what is not required, and so that they can bring in more profitability. So I think it from that perspective, it directly impacts the profitability of the organizations, bring a better value to the customer, and ultimately, it kind of brings more focus than what customer is looking towards as a value. And you keep only those things, what is being perceived as value or what customer is ready to pay for. Otherwise, everything else is a non-valuated activity. Exactly. 
right so uh, john i'll come back to you i think uh, before that uh, kuldeep i have one question for you what are the typical type of waste which are available in lean methodology and uh, how it can be utilized in various segments i mean be it manufacturing and uh, i mean because it it cut across uh, sectors so how would it be impactful on those different type of waste and what are the usage of it you know or or how what are the applications of it if you can just throw some light on that yeah sure uh, like typically the methodology prescribes or suggests that there are seven types of waste and and the simplest way to remember that is tim board that is t for transportation i for inventory m for motion uh, w for waiting o for over processing for production and finally the defects so and, i mean i have a so there was a different uh, you know sorry to cut you short uh, so there was a different thing which has come up recently is called downtime yes so downtime is the another one and easy to remember that you are reducing the downtime of anything and that's how it becomes easier and uh, of late uh, there have been talks about uh, adding one more and i i okay. strongly believe that uh, that is also an important waste which is the waste of talent in absolutely uh, because many a times uh, uh, people are not utilizing their uh, assets predominantly the human resources which is the talent uh, to their full potential and capacity uh, mainly the potential part because what even i have seen in various uh, things is uh, people at middle management and senior management levels spend almost 30 to 40% of their time on administrative tasks which can be easily uh, uh, is not adding any value either reviewing a report or signing up a voucher which uh, they are not adding any value so on and so forth uh, which actually can be looked at in terms of is that activity really required so waste is something uh, you know broadly when we look at any process uh in in the value chain right from the input which in a manufacturing organization could be a raw material or in a service organization could be an information and how that input uh, moves through the various stages of processing till it reaches to the customer which the, in in form of a product or service which he or she is expecting and today's customer being uh, wanting many things he wants flexibility he wants he is impatient he wants everything uh, at a click of a button uh, he he is expecting uh, earlier quality was something which was considered as a novelty but today it is given that i need to have good quality product so another acronym like uh, on time in full error free o t i f e f i i the customer expects on time uh, as what he is expecting in full means if i am expecting the deliverables uh, in in a particular stock or a particular quantity and absolutely error free and that is uh, not only restricting to the product but also to the the service which comes in later like for example if 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 we go to a restaurant the product is the food which we are having but if the bell is incorrect or the car, the, the at the end of the food when he brings the if that is incorrect it is a defect it's not though i have received the quantity in full and on time so it is being looked at in the very holistic manner in terms of and and wastes are like there everywhere uh, the irony is when uh, organizations are focusing on improvements uh, like to just give you an analogy uh, when when we look at an entire processing time or an entire end to end time let's let's say that the entire time is set in minutes of which the actual time which is required by the user or by the machine is 4 minutes um uh, wherein the 60 other 60% is going on various other tasks uh when people are focusing on improvements or productive improvements they are looking at how do we cut this 4 minutes to 2 minutes and they are not focusing on the 6 minutes which are actually going waste or of those 6 minutes maybe there are 4 minutes which are actually going waste like the initial question which you had for john in terms of the lean and the six sigma 
that that's the the way i look at it that lean focuses on end to end value chain and six sigma is focusing on how do i control variation in the process which, which is which is being there so every step like when we talk about over processing in it we typically see that uh, there is a study in fact that uh, close to only about 20 to 22% of the features or the functionalities of any systems are used by the users which is a classic example of over processing rest features and functionalities are not used at all but they have been produced and customer is asked to pay for it and it requires more time to produce those uh, functionalities as, as well and out of those which are used most of them are again defects which go into maintenance so that's a different story in terms of how it works uh, but yes the, the there are these kinds of wastes which are there whenever we go to a supermarket the time which we spend on in the queue to get our bills out or to get our checks out is again a waste of time because we are wasting time waiting over there and and not uh, actually doing what we want so there are various applications wherein we can look at how to eliminate or reduce these wastes okay uh kuldeep i have one specific question from the small and medium businesses mm -hmm. uh to you uh, see large corporates have got resources they right. can deploy a lot of methodologies i mean they have dedicated teams on quality and process excellence with lean and uh, six sigma experts but when it comes to small and medium businesses and uh, i'm talking about those organizations which are probably 20 25 set of people or maybe even more but they don't understand the value of lean today for them you know everything is going to take some time they are this already leaner i mean even if the organization is 100 plus employees they feel that they are leaner what do you recommend to them in terms of lean deployment and why they should be deploying deploy lean at a very early stage of the organization well uh it lean is actually a a habit i would say a habit of continuous improvement or a culture of continuous improvement let's put it as a culture of continuous improvement and any culture to develop requires a series of habits to be developed and one of the habit critical habit is to question is the customer going to pay me for this activity by every employee in the organization so there are so many activities which we do in the organization as a part of processes as a part of steps as a part of transactions as a part of activities so on and so forth is am i going am i adding any value in in this particular step and is the customer willing to pay me for this uh is a uh, activity or this action or this extra thing which i am doing so on and so forth. if the answer is yes then naturally i am doing any i am doing a value add activity if the answer is no then there could be two parts to it one is is this required because there is a statutory or a regulatory requirement and i am forced to do it and if i it is a statutory requirement i have no choice but i have to do it the if it is not in the first two buckets then naturally it's a non value add activity which i should not be doing so at the beginning of any process or any task or any activity if every employee in the organization how small or big the organization is if that habit or that culture is built in to question that is is this a value add or a non value add or the third category is a business value add which is the statutory and the regulatory part of it now uh, that culture can be developed irrespective of size and well though expertise and methodology is required but there is there are simple tools uh, which any and every organization can adopt and implement without actually engaging in consultant or an expert uh, from the outside as well the, the 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 success is in terms of how is this culture getting built up if we have the typical culture like what we have in india you mentioned in the beginning that chinese price and it of good quality well for that we'll have to develop the culture of quality in this country we have a chalta hai attitude or a culture in the country right now this chalta hai is not focusing on quality the moment we have a quality culture in the uh, country definitely we will be more competitive than any other country because we have the right talent and the right uh, availability 
as well. So size, irrespective of the size, it's more about the habits what we build in our employees, which will set the culture in the organization. So the, in fact, the larger organization face challenges because they treat it as a project. They treat it as an initiative. And their focus is that how many lean projects have I executed, which is detrimental to continuous improvement. Lean talks about continuous improvement daily, day in, day in, day out, like what John was mentioning earlier in terms of the, the chefs looking at what changes they can make and improve, the bartender looking at what he can uh, do uh, at his workplace. So it's a culture which is being built, whereas in the large organizations, they focus on how many projects I have executed and what is the savings I have developed. So it's actually the other way around. It's reasonably simpler and easier to adopt because it's easier to build that culture in the small size organization. Absolutely. I think you have brought up a very important point here, uh, which is culture. I think quality is all about setting up the right culture. And uh, when I've been working with organizations and uh, even while developing, uh, you know, my own startups and now Bringle, the only thing which we kind of figure out or we, we try to ensure is that how deeper is my, how deep is my quality DNA? How strong is my quality DNA? And this DNA has to be in each individual. Everybody has to look at it from the quality perspective. Yes, quantity does matter, but there is a quality aspect which is much more essential when we talk about any delivery onto that because customer ultimately is paying for the quality. Now, you may change, you may have a different pricing available and, you know, accordingly set up the pricing. You cannot say that, the you know, I have decided this low pricing because of the customer, but I can give you only this. So if you are deciding to a right quality, decide that quality, set up the right pricing. And that has to be deep within the all, you know, uh, levels of your organizations, be it the last uh, leg of the person. In fact, uh, we work with some of the educational institutions today and we try to, uh, you know, kind of tell them that why are you trying to do deploy? They have quality circles, you know, mm -hmm. within their uh, institute. Now, some institutes have started setting up that, but they're struggling always with improving their, uh, you know, UGC scorings or the HR ministry or the ministry scorings which they are supposed to do. And the main aspect is there is about the lean deployment and, you know, uh, quality culture bringing in and they're, they're badly struggling. I mean, their teachers quality, their students, uh, you know, the facilities, the infrastructure quality, all is actually we are talking about the culture part of it. Now, if you do not bring that culture or understanding of a lean methodology or a quality perspective till the bottom level of the person, even to the level of a peon, the person would never understand, the organization will never be able to grow. Because even if one person does not contribute or creates an uh, you know, uh, opposite effect, or does not support the activity, the entire organization will uh, come down. So it's all about how strong your quality DNA is. Are you able to, you know, transform your quality uh, perspective, or I would say transform the people's mindset into a quality mindset. And once that happens, that DNA is built, any organization, be it small, big and large, it will definitely grow to a very, very, you know, efficient level. And in fact, as you rightly said, when you are small, it is much easier to deploy rather than when you grow large, like large organizations, they struggle today to actually, you know, bring that culture down to the, you know, to the bottom most employee, to an analyst or a, maybe a, you know, a fresher who is joining the organization. And till that time, that level, because when they interact with the customer, they have to understand the value of the quality. They have to understand the value what needs to be delivered to the customer. And if that is taken care of, it takes large time. It's, it takes really, really a humongous time to, you know, reach down to that level. So if your organization, when it is small, we can build it up right from there. It becomes pretty uh, easier to manage when they grow large. Uh, with this, uh, uh, Bala, if you're there, I would want your perspective uh, on this, especially from the large organizations you have worked in uh, India and, uh, you know, and uh, how it is so important to build up the quality DNA within the organizations.
Am I audible? Yeah, but I've just unmuted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, basically, to supplement what uh, John and uh, Kuldeep said, um, uh, both uh, Six Sigma and Lean are uh, improvement methodologies. Uh, as uh, both of them said, and you also uh, reiterated that, uh, Lean is a culture. Culture of workflow simplification and then smoothening the workflow. Uh, Six Sigma is more of an intervention uh, where you need to uh, get the improvement very objectively measured. So both have their own uh, uh, merits and uh, their own places. Uh, coming specifically to your uh, topic, uh, it's, it's uh, very relevant because uh, as I know, uh, our organization, you know, I was working for uh, Wipro uh, at the time. This was about uh, 14, 15 years ago. When we uh, thought about uh, uh, a methodology uh, to improve the software processes. And at the time, we had a fair experience of uh, Six Sigma. We had reached some level of uh, maturity in that. And then we were looking for a newer methodology. So in fact, uh, uh, some of our senior executives uh, went around the world. They looked at uh, EFQM. They looked at uh, uh, Malcolm Baldrige, uh, uh, you know, methodology. And they incidentally, they visited uh, Toyota in Japan and then came across the TPS also, Toyota Production System. So uh, the executives were impressed by the uh, uh, applicability of uh, TPS in a larger organization. Because this was around 2004, 2005, uh, the company was already, uh, you know, uh, more than 40, uh, 45,000 people. So if you have to introduce a new methodology, it cannot be something like a Six Sigma where you have to teach a statistics and things like that to people. So it has to be a kind of a culture and then uh, not very objective, a little bit of subjectivity is uh, involved, but then it has to smoothen the workflow and thereby achieve the improvement. So we picked up uh, the uh, TPS uh, and tried to apply it in the software development. Uh, probably we were the first to do it. We took up each of the lean tenants, you know, whether it is a SMED or uh, any of the lean tenant, and then uh, try to apply to uh, the software development. Uh, what we learned in the subsequent two years, uh, now around 2004 to 2006, is that uh, uh, not all tenets of lean are uh, amenable for adoption in, uh, say, in the software development or in the IT sector. Uh, so what we decided is that there are certain things uh, like value stream mapping or uh, in a continuous improvement or Kaizen or even things like a SMAD, a single minute exchange of dice, which are all very specific to manufacturing sector. We could easily adapt it. For example, SMAD was easily adapted in a test environment, in software test environment. So some uh, tenets could be easily be uh, adopted in the uh, IT and software environment. There were some which had to be tweaked to adapt to software environment. And there are certain tenets which are not uh, possible to be adapted. So we took that approach and then came out with uh, uh, a lean methodology. That is when uh, people started using lean. And uh, I remember uh, the first time when we coined the word lean, uh, many people did not really understand what it meant in a IT or a software development environment. But nevertheless, we pursued with that and then it did uh, really uh, help. Uh, so the point here is that uh, lean becomes very handy uh, and uh, you know applicable when the organization is fairly large with a diverse set of people. And you have to uh, infuse the continuous improvement initiative, not as an intervention, but as a culture. So from that perspective, it became uh, very handy. And uh, our success with Lean vis-a-vis -vis Six Sigma was uh, much higher uh, because of the uh, way it could be assimilated into this. 
But if it is a smaller organization, uh, this also goes to a point uh, that was discussed, uh, I think, by Kuldeep and uh, John also. If it is a smaller organization, uh, you do not have the provision to have an expert. But then uh, the beauty of the lean is that uh, one of the senior leaders or a couple of the senior leaders can easily understand the lean concepts and then be the lean facilitator for the organization. You don't require a Six Sigma uh, kind of a, a facilitator who needs to be well-versed in uh, data analytics and the statistical analysis. Here, it is more of an application that is required understanding the concept, uh, uh, you know, relating it to the value stream map that is there. Ultimately, both of them are focused on delivering value to the customer. So, it is possible, even in a smaller organization, where uh, there is no provision for having a overhead like a lean facilitator, some of the senior people can easily understand, uh, you know, internalize the lean concept uh, in relation to their organization and their operation, and then facilitate the team. And uh, in startups, like uh, kind of an environment, it is best that it is set at the beginning. That's what we did in my company. I, I ran a company which is about six years old. Uh, the very beginning, we set that culture. When we were hardly eight to nine people, we set the culture. Today, we are about 70 people. So that culture, because it was set at the beginning and uh, very religiously practiced, uh, it has uh, been accepted. Uh, it is uh, uh, the first thing to be uh, told to the people who are joining from outside or the fresher. They have no other way of thinking. They automatically come to the track of thinking in the lean way or uh, the value creation way. So uh, different organizations we can apply, it, but uh, the bottom line is uh, lean as a concept is equally applicable whether it is a large established organization. The way you implement is uh, slightly different. It's uh, good for even a small and medium-sized organization. The way you introduce their uh, practice, it is slightly different. It is even applicable for a startup which is starting with two or three people today. There, you apply it differently. So in all cases, you can still apply lean uh, for the benefit of the organization. It's not only deli value delivery to the customer, it's a large value to the organization itself. Did it answer uh, your question, Anshu? Very well, uh, Bala, and I think thank you so much for bringing in such a you know vast coverage from right from the large organization to a small and medium to a startup. And uh, I think you're very well uh, explained, and you've brought you know you've kind of set up your organization also pretty well as per the lean culture. So I think that brings out a very important focus. Uh, John, I have one question for you. Uh, in the current scenario, when we all know that lean is all about culture and things, how do you think we can implement that into the, you know, education segment, specifically when it comes to college students who are into variety of different things and even in the school children uh, category, should we kind of uh, try deploying those lean principles right from an early on so that they can start deploying that into their household uh, things slowly and their educational setup and then eventually when they go to the organization they're actually well prepared yes uh, that's a great point um i think um probably the other speakers would join me too in welcoming more and more um lean thinking um at the lower levels uh so that we're indoctrinating that sort of culture that we were talking about um, just having a basic problem-solving culture, which uh, Lean and also Six Sigma help develop, uh, critical thinking, um, basic process design um, elements, like how do you design a workplace so it's easy for the people doing the work, um, that, that kids could learn these, um, some of these basic things. And then, you know, there's even more fundamental things that we, we teach in Lean there's two sides of uh, two pillars of, of lean thinking that Toyota taught us. One of them was Kaizen. We tend to focus on uh, for, for obviously for improvement for processes or the whole business. There was an, there's another pillar that didn't get a lot of attention, 
and it's called respect. Um, and in the lean context, it's uh, not just being nice to people, but it, it's, uh, it's actually respecting their, their minds, respecting their ability to develop, their ability to grow. Um, and only when those two are in kind of a yin-yang uh, balance, kaizen and respect, do we see the real, true, sustainable high performance because we're actually engaging people but this notion of respect that um, I'm sure, for example, in schools, for example, in India, people get indoctrinated with some of those elements. They can see that it's also helpful for them as they grow up in, as professionals, um, and not just in society, but that notion of respecting people. And Toyota has actually expanded that notion to respect humanity, respect communities that we work in, um, and even respect the environment. So Toyota has uh, 2050 very aggressive goals for completely zero emissions, zero carbon, everything. Um, so what we're seeing is now more of a total holistic look at improvement, um, not only for business results, um, but, but for really kind of society as a whole. And what a wonderful thing that would be to, to teach to our children, wouldn't it? Yeah, thanks. I think uh, you're right, John. Uh, the Toyota has not just, uh, you know, talked about lean in, a, in the processes point of view. It also has actually changed the environment. It also has given a different way of thinking to the people. And, uh, you know, and respect the environment as well as the people into it and then give, deliver value to the customer. Uh, so I think that's a very important point. And John, uh, how, I would also want to know, you know, from a Singapore or Southeast Asia company's point of view, because you have got a lot of experience around that. Uh, what do you think is the adoption of lean uh, methodologies? And uh, is it is it like being there for some time, or they have uh, started? Uh, you know, deploying that now, how's the kind of adoption in these uh, countries at this point? Or, you know, probably across the globe, if you have, uh, if you can throw some light on that. Uh, yeah, I think in Singapore, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty standard story, I think, where we see here, like many other places, lots of great examples. Um, but of course, a lot of opportunities to spread further. Um, and, um, in, in a lot of cases around the world, there are, since Lean has been around for a while, like you mentioned in the chat box, the machine that changed the world, I think that came out around 1990. So it's been, it's been a while. It was so ahead of its time though. It's, so, it's still relevant now. Uh, but a lot of folks um, looked at it, they took out a few pieces um, and then they started implementing things um, without you know, looking at, like we had mentioned, the, the cultural elements, for example. So they might think that they have done lean, um, but they may not have done it uh, really the way, the way it was supposed to have been done. Um, Sector-wise, uh, healthcare in Singapore has been using lean for a while. Um, and we have stories around the world now with the coronavirus where uh, using some lean thinking has been literally saving some lives uh, by improving patient flow and patient outcomes. And I'm sure Six Sigma probably has some stories uh, for that as well. Um, precision manufacturing has been there for a while. And uh, there are the new areas like lean hotels, uh, Marina Bay Sands, the big famous hotel uh, that you might have seen with the big pool on top. Um, they're actually using Lean and Six Sigma uh, at, right now. I'll be helping them with a few things later this year. Um, and uh, you mentioned school. So we, the universities, um, there's one right near me, uh, Singapore Management University and other ones, they actually have a Lean office. So they're helping internal processes in the university. Somewhat separately, there's also something called Lean Education which there's not very many cases as we like around the world. So I think that's a great opportunity where you're actually rethinking, reimagining and redesigning the process of, of education. 
from end to end and really probably tying it better with industry and what does industry need as, as far as skills because usually you see a big gap right between what industry needs and what the schools are putting out so the lean thinker would be would be thinking about how do you reinvent the whole education process and along with that is something called lean learning how do you apply lean lean thinking to the process of learning um, so there's all kinds of exciting areas and we see uh, yes, yeah, some of those areas are in Singapore and the region in Asia um, and really all across the world. In our Lean Global Network, we have literally, we've got every continent other than Antarctica <laughs> with lots of great examples, but yet, yet still a lot of opportunities to do more. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, John. I think uh, that's a very good example of, uh, you know, what you mentioned of various things today especially about the Lean University, which you're talking about and how they're managing their entire school in a very lean manner. And uh, if we can bring up, in fact, I was talking to my daughter and my, uh, you know, and I was actually telling her about the lean seven or nine types of waste. So Kuldeep, I have my own, uh, you know, segment of nine types of waste. Uh, including with mist soap, uh, whatever the people utilization you're talking about, we kind of make it as misutilization of resources or underutilization of resources. So it can be people or any other kind of uh, infrastructure or any kind of resources for that matter. So, uh, you know, that is where uh, it becomes very, very important. And when I was talking to my daughter, it starts from a basic uh, aspect, which we always tell our children in terms of cleaning and keeping the things right and you know numbering them making them structured this is nothing but lean we call that as 5s very clearly very easily you know that's a standard methodology 5s in lean but actually it can be applied right from the early start we can teach our children how to keep the house right our i think the housewives the women have been doing in their homes by marking those you know, their uh, normal spices and all that with the right labeling and all that, that is nothing but lean. So I think the lean is a daily household uh, aspect. It is just that we have given, Toyota has given that it is a basic good nomenclature and created as an entire end-to-end -end, uh, structure for, for a large organization as well. Uh, I think that's, that's something it is going to be very, very important when it comes to the lean. And of course, when it comes to the Six Sigma, it might be a little more technical, statistical, more mathematical, you know, and require more of analysis and data. But lean is, as I think uh, you and uh, Kuldeep also have mentioned, it is the entire structure, right from the leadership level to the execution level. And it is not just having a methodology, it also involves uh, the way you run your organization, the way your leadership works, the way your thinking process works. So all of that brings consolidated into that. So that's something really great. And uh, with this, I would want to request Mani, uh, you know, because Mani has designed uh, this program called Design Your Unicorn, which is actually uh, uh, for Bringal. And he's working, uh, you know, in, in, for that program as a strategic partner. Uh, have already got experience with dozens of startups to support. Uh, Muddy, what I would want to know from you is how this lean component you are bringing in this cross-border blended learning program, which is the design your unicorn. So what is that your thought when you, uh, you know, kind of brought that lean culture into that? Uh, thanks, Anshar. Thanks for that. Uh, see, as we have been discussing uh, most of the uh, topics of lean, I definitely uh, agree with all the speakers and all, all what they have shared so far of how Lean uh, and Six Sigma can be helpful. And let me just put this in inside of a startup. See, typically what happens in a startup scenario is like uh, we have an idea and we, we just build some value around that idea. And we start rushing that idea into the market to acquire momentum for the value. But what we miss in the overall picture is we miss something called as business model that can actually tell whether the value can be attained from this idea and can it be scalable. So in process of doing that, there are various techniques like various methodologies that can be applied to build a business model 
uh, like you can use design thinking. There are a lot of custom models, like uh, for example, say form to fork. A lot of models can be applied. But end of the day, uh, to arrive at a value, because again, going back to uh, customers, uh, keeping the customer in view and trying to deliver a value, the best way you could do it as, uh, uh, for a startup, considering the points that we have here, like uh, to start from the beginning, to keep it as a culture and all, uh, the best thing a startup can do is like build a lean model of their idea and embed or embed or embed that into part of the business model. So when they build over the business model and then try to experiment that business model in various options or various uh, markets or various kinds of uh, customers, it can give more standard results for them to understand how the idea can be taken to a next level. And once this can be drafted, documented and looked at, that's when we can confidently say this, the challenges on scalability, the changes, uh, challenges on sustainability of the idea, all this can be achieved. And that's exactly we have designed in the form of Unicorn, uh, Design Year Unicorn, the program, where we have given five stages and we take the startup through each and every stage, where uh, in the first stage, we tell them how to validate the idea. Second stage, we tell them how to build the effective business model and try to test in the market and try to understand the feedback. In the third stage, we apply this kind of lean techniques and metrics on the startup model or a business model, which can help them understand how to get the early revenues or get the customer feedback. And then they can extrapolate or multiply that kind of value that is generated at this level to the next uh, level where they can apply a lot of metrics and try to uh, scale it up. And once all these things go in the right way, then you, your startup can take to any level and your idea can fit any market and you can reach out to any border or cross border or anywhere. So that's exactly the way we have also structured the stages in uh, Design Your Unicorn. That's how we say as a white uh, startup or a yellow startup, which is an ideation, green startup, which is making early revenues, or a blue startup, which is all the blue ocean strategy, what everyone wants. And finally, once everything is ready, then the startup can take the opportunities of the universe. That's where we say as a black uh, or a universe, black stage uh, startup or a universe startup. So definitely Design Your Unicorn is kept in mind of all the techniques from the ideation side and also the concepts of Lean. And definitely there is a chance to apply Six Sigma and all the other uh, statistical uh, variations and models to arrive at the desired value for the customer. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks Mani for that such a nice explanation. And uh, I think I would just like to add there that while we were designing this program, Design Your Unicorn uh, for startups, we were not considered, while the startup is, is going to be a kind of a buzzword in the industry today, uh, but what it, you know, what it matters is that we are doing some business. When it comes to business, there is a customer. Whenever there is a customer, there has to be well-defined processes. Whenever there is a well-defined processes, there has to be a lean methodology it has to be done the leaner, the best efficient manner. Once it is done, and once you have a large set of data coming in, you can actually start talking about the reducing the variations, wherein probably the Six Sigma and other methodologies would start coming in. Uh, and, you know, it is, the whole idea here is that right when you have, probably not even having an idea right now, you just want to, you just have a thought that you want to become an entrepreneur, you can actually have a model by which you can design your startup so that it will eventually become a unicorn. And that's the reason why we named it as design your unicorn because, and it does not mean that you can only design or aim for a unicorn only when you reach to a black belt or a black, you know, you've achieved a good amount of revenues. What we are talking about is that even at the time when you don't even have a proper idea, you have a couple of ideas going on in your mind and you're just trying to validate that, just try to enable that in the in, into the environment is what 
you can at that point in itself there are various tools and methodologies available which are, are basically can be utilized to ensure that you will eventually move into a unicorn stage and i think that is where the four pillars of uh, this entire strength uh, starts from there that is where we started with our first uh, week of topic of thought leadership which basically talks about the individuality individual perspective because you starting as an individual and your leadership starts from there you are a, you are a leader you have to bring in lot of followers for you the second week goes about when you start talking about your customer and when you understand about your customer then you have to figure out that what you need to be doing what is the customer requirement how do you bring that customer delight what is the kind of you know uh, methodology by which you can bring in how you can understand both internal and in, uh, external customers importance and this week which is now more on process so process become takes it to the you know the second level wherein lot of lean methodologies would help you out to basically structure your organization much better develop the quality dna set up the foundation and once we move on to the next stage which is the large typically of a small or medium organization or even a large organization your lot of data will start coming in and that is where you need to have enable the right technology based on the processes you have set up you have to uh, analyze the data you have to protect the data because of the it world the cyber security issues will start dropping up so this is how the entire program is what uh, i think mani has spoken about and categorized into the five stages and it becomes very critical for people to take away their focus from only investments to back to the business because ultimately now post covid scenario and there are a lot of reports going on i mean sequoia capital has recently published some uh, webinars and you know reports wherein they are going to talk about more investments on the online platforms like you know bringal which is more of blended learning platform which are more of online platforms uh, they are more talking about platforms or you know focusing more on unit economics rather than those cash burn scenarios a uh, lot of companies like snapdeal they have also followed up the same story like uh, you know success stories like flipkarts and all but then they changed their models because they were actually into the stage in 2015 so i was getting a, uh, i got an opportunity to hear founders of snapdeal in taikon mumbai uh, where deepak parekh and uh, you know uh, ratan tata and uh, narayan murthy were present and what they were talking about is that how industry has kind of changed the uh, you know uh, focus from cash burn models to a unit economics model which means that if each unit you produce you are able to bring value out of it and you put in only those charge it uh, you know uh, put in only those thing which customer is ready to pay for which is actually a very lean methodology and that comes in financial that comes in processes that comes in many other aspects so i think with this i would just want to uh, you know uh, request john to just answer one more question out here uh, john considering the uh, current scenario i think in the large organizations also we have been uh, putting in lot of resources we were very very people intensive uh, into the organizations now once this lean methodology started coming in how people are you know uh, organizations focus are shifting from people to process uh yeah it's that's a really good question um for for today um I guess you know in lean thinking we we look at it all uh, together. Um, Jim Womack, one of the authors that you mentioned in the chat there, uh, James P. Womack, um, that wrote the first book that mentioned lean. So he used to always say uh, purpose, process, and people um, almost interchangeably, um, and then you could also add uh, perhaps technology on that. Um, so, what we try to do is look at everything very seamlessly, and put uh, put the customer first, put the process next, and then how does the technology and and people fit into that? Uh, so, uh, in one sense, instead of looking at the org chart, we look at the process map first. Um, so there's uh, there would be a lot of opportunities to. Look at uh, high-level processes as well as the smaller ones, 
And like some of the other speakers had said, really take a look at what is their value add? Anything that's not adding value, um, why, you know, why are we doing it? If the customer's not willing to pay for it. Um, and if people come out of the system, the lean approach is uh, because we're always about adding value and not just cutting waste. Um, and we had already mentioned the eighth types of waste, or he had mentioned eight or nine, was that terrible waste of unutilized potential. So when we uh, do have um, people that might come out of uh, through a process improvement, the idea is that we don't uh, put them on the street, but we reallocate them towards more valuable activities. We might even need to retrain them um, because there's always parts of the business that we wish we could work on if we just had more resources, right? And uh, if we can free up those resources to work on those valuable things, then we can really look at uh, innovation and, and uh, looking past uh, what's happening right now and in, into new areas. Um, and finally, I think another burgeoning area, so this is another part of lean that uh, is, and someone had mentioned, I think the ecosystem too. So looking past uh, internal processes and really looking at the touch points externally too. And if we empower our people at the lower levels to do problem solving and continuous improvement, like we mentioned with lean culture, that frees up the managers to look at more systems level. So systems thinking and bringing in, um, uh, cause we think that's really the wave of the future is not to just focus internal, but what's the external uh, touch points. And to do that, we have to look past our four walls and thus the leaders, the CEOs of the future are gonna be spending more of their time outside than inside, we think. Yeah, thanks, John. I think uh, very well said. Uh, Kuldeep, I have one, uh, another question for you. Uh, you know, now how the difference is happening whenever there is a problem in, in an organization or there is an error or a customer uh, issue or there is a complaint, we have a tendency, I have seen this tendency in organizations that we always start finding out who is the culprit, who is the person who is responsible for it. And we actually start, we say, sack that person who has not done it well. How do you think that people are, is the people are responsible for those kind of errors or is the process which is more imp important, which needs to be corrected? Well, that reminds me of uh, one of the interesting things which I used to tell my testing team. I was leading a software testing team for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And I was telling always that software testing or any testing is a non-value-add activity which should not be done. But right. yes, after jobs will continue because developers will continue to make it. <laughs> and the irony of that was that if there used to be any defect reported in production, or beyond the phase of testing, which my team was supposed to do testing. The question used to, the first question used to be asked that who tested it? Right. The question never came who developed it, Absolutely. who designed it, or who gave in the requirement. Right. And I used to always say that, well, the testing team has done whatever was given to them as a product. Now, if your requirements process has not been done properly, if your design activity has been circumvented, developer wanted to push the product through, and the tester, somebody was sitting on his head saying that, well, it needs to be, be sent tomorrow. So do whatever and give me a report. This is what you get. Now, that brings to the focus what you asked in terms of that in a people-centric organization, when I say people-centric, it's people-dependent, not that people-focused or employee engagement right. kind of organization, but people-dependent organization, wherein the success or failure of the product process, service, or the organization is dependent on the, those star performers, which typically are crisis managed. Well, they will come out of all crisis uh, unskated and they will resolve everything. The life of those organizations is too short because the, the backbone of processes is not existing. Those guys go away, something happens, some emergency, the organization or the products uh, go down in, in a jiffy. And hence, we focus on processes. Even if we look at uh, the current situation of COVID-19, what is there? 
and it is interesting to relate in terms of how a problem solving approach whether consciously or subconscious is being applied and people are defining maybe processes on the book like yesterday evening or today morning there was this uh, article which was there where in classifying into the zones that is red yellow and green and accordingly lockdowns to be staggeredly lifted that process never existed because lockdowns never were thought of in 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 most of the countries in the world but then processes are getting developed it's not an individual who is decide and that's to the other point wherein you were talking about education and uh, uh, how do we bring in into the education industry one is application of lean and the other is that henceforth going forward or even even today majority of the things are the leadership is not at a at a central it's it's distributed leadership across and that is where in decision making authorities empowerments are cutting across because the executive will give the support the the execution will be happened by the experts and somebody would be taking those services as a consumer or a customer and hence the value chain whether it is internal external and linkages which are there well defined processes will help to establish those linkages in advance will help to identify the potential failures in advance and accordingly the risks associated with that proactively in terms of that if, if there is going to be some failure at a particular point or a potential likelihood of a failure accordingly mitigation plans or contingency plans would be defined so it is going to be a holistic approach in terms of when we talk it's, it's not a, a manufacturing or a service process but it's the entire process of how am i strategizing how am i putting it in operation how am i selling it how am i distributing it how am i accounting it it's that whole thing like somebody was talking about business modeling and those those become the vital components of of any business model or any business organization and hence having that process backbone of uh, many people think that process means a document a documented process well that's a nice to have in my mind but then even if it is not documented but understood documentation helps to ensure compliance and also helps to ensure adherence uh, may or may not guarantee quality but adoption and implementation of even an undocumented process consistently across the organization definitely would guarantee quality. and consistent so uh, the myth that a process needs to be documented well it's a myth fact is that processes do get implemented many people would like to document it later but documentation helps in bringing new people on board especially with the large organization and that's where in the differences between small organizations and large or large organizations as well come in i'm not denying the fact that documenting processes is important but then it's not necessary that the processes all processes need to be documented there there could be various levels in in the aspect but yes processes do form a valuable and an important backbone on on the success of the organization i think kuldeep you have brought up a point of uh, standardization with the process uh, documentation and uh, that is the standardization is required because then when multiple people keep coming in no none of us uh, i mean will have time to train uh, and tell everybody that you are doing this mistake you have to follow this process and stuff so documentation is definitely required may not be for a small organization immediately but eventually it will be required even if it is a one or two people it is better to document a process uh, and then you know train the people as per those processes so another two aspect which you brought it up and probably from the, i'm just trying to terming it with respect to the lean methodology is one is first time right yes uh because when we talked about software testing and i always say that quality is actually a non value added activity quality check i mean yes because it means that if you have to do a quality check you have done you have not done something right you have already wasted that there is a waste which is already created in the in the entire environment or the organization what you are trying to do is you are trying to put up another effort to ensure that that the quality does not get passed or that bad quality does not get passed to the customer but customer is not paying for the same i mean they are not bothered how much time how many times you have 
you know kind of struggle to get this right product in place what they are seeing is the product for which they are ready to pay the price absolutely and the, unless we are able to define that like for a simple example that it is always good uh, to have you know best of the like kingfisher for that matter the airlines they started giving all those you know best of those uh, you know earphones and everything but who is looking for that i mean maybe 50% of the people or even 20 30% of the people used to use it and rest of them only used to carry that along with them and it was such a wasteful activity and extra active, you know cost which they have put in and which kind of killed that organization i mean of course that is one example there are many more examples into into that entire model but that is only one point the another point which you have brought up is the visual control uh because see what happens when you when a somebody when individual is running that uh you know process or working on that process unless that process is available in front of them how the results are coming in that also has to be taken care with respect to very visually available to them and uh john you know from an it organization or from any other organization uh how do you see visual uh, control is important and what are the different kind of visual controls which we can brought in into an organization this one's for uh, for me yeah yes yes john okay thank you um you know interesting you see around uh in our in our little whatsapp groups uh in the lean community we share a lot of the visual controls that are happening now with with the coronavirus uh for example here in singapore there was a rule for a while in in our food courts in our in our public food areas like uh where people would be sitting next to each other pretty close we no one was allowed to sit next to another person uh so what they did was a very lean concept was they start taping with a with a uh with an x a red x on the seats that you're not allowed to sit in so you walk in the place you know in one second you know I can sit here I cannot sit here and it's just such a beautifully simple example of uh lean thinking visual control out there that um anybody can use um So at a worker level, what are the visual controls that make the work easier? Um and then at a management level, what are the visual controls that we need uh for critical information? Uh because uh, now a lot of data and information and uh is it's all locked into a computer somewhere. Computers are great for analysis. They're not so great for getting a team around uh solve looking at for, for potential problems or opportunities and really uh doing some problem solving as a team so we love to get critical information out of the computers and put them even if it's on a whiteboard uh what's the most important thing for that particular team it could be a low level team at the ground level like um we mentioned the the hotel you know they were using a whiteboard um in housekeeping to monitor their critical like for example how many people coming in uh what's their turnover time for for a room cleaning whatever is important for them at their level and then as you go up to the, even the leadership level they're using visual controls for what's important at their level so micro and macro um we think the visual controls really help uh in design the work uh maintain the work and manage the work yeah i think john very well exam very good example uh, specifically in the current times and how a lean uh, thinking or even a visual control a simple aspect can be utilized and i have also seen in india we see that on every outside every shop they have made those circles or a square boxes where you have to stand and there is a social distancing you know kind of a 1 meter or kind of small distance which they have kept in and if you are not following in in that the shopkeeper himself is saying that you know you cannot get the things please stand in queue and you have to stand in those boxes only uh and i think that's another it's a very wonderful example of that cross you know box cross mark which mm-hmm. you have mentioned and 
physically it is it is definitely is happening and i think in technology world it is much more easier with our lot of uh, you know early warning systems and things like that which is i think we will go on and on in this in this topic uh with this i would uh, want to ask sharmila if she is uh, she can kind of talk about little bit of lean principles and the usage specifically from the disability point of view and bring her thoughts that how it is useful for the people who are disabled and uh, you know how it can be implemented in various different organizations uh, to utilize the lead making uh good evening people uh, i am very sure that we can implement a lot of things but uh would it be uh, cost effective and that that is one thing that we have to see one uh, aspect is the entire organization or the entire lean organization being implemented for a uh, office in uh, as far as accessibility is concerned it's a huge cost yes today if we are looking at uh, something digital then uh, probably uh, the cost is at an individual level where uh, uh, we in add or subtract things uh, on our systems ourselves but beyond that uh, ansha it's going to be cost heavy it's really cost heavy okay and uh, is it i i have uh, made certain changes in uh, my uh, earlier organizations i at a certain level but not beyond that so uh, uh, when it comes to cost yes people will falter okay uh, but see i think from a small there are there could be very small small cost uh, which can be incurred and made it more leaner i mean uh, it can be still a leaner and take care of the disability uh, aspects of the people who are disabled like one of the example which we recently i recently saw in a restaurant the restaurant was at uh, at the first floor and what they have done is they have put up uh, uh, basically alongside the staircase uh, they have put up that uh, electric uh, chair which Mr. they can chair yeah right. and it's a very small it's a very simple gesture but not very yeah. cost uh, costly as well but it helps them to increase their business and because it will give them uh, you know the elderly elderly people can go the disabled people can go and the children can uh, you know the children can use it so lot of applications which it happens now it may not cost a bit it is still a lean thinking and the beautifully they have done is they have now increased the set of customers for them see i have i have thought of a mechanic chair myself uh, because i have old parents uh, at home uh, you have seen my house uh, it is a two story place but the thing is if i install it so uh yes a uh, a uh, business house can do that but at an individual level uh, it, it doesn't work i uh, i have that with me those figures are there got it i think your point is uh, valid uh, sharmila so i was only trying to understand that uh, how critical is going to be having that uh, 
you know, in, in the organization, the disability angle and uh, how the lean practices can be built in over there. Uh, but I think I got a fair idea uh, on this. And Sharmila, I know that you work a lot of, uh, you know, you do a lot of work in terms of disability audits for the organization, small and big, including education institutions and supporting them on various technology uh, aspects as well when it comes to the platforms and specifically when you develop Bringle platform to make it more inclusive. So I think very interestingly, uh, which things are being brought up. You want to share something, Shamila? Yes, I do. I have been researching uh, a lot of other platforms also, as you know. Um, most of them don't have what we have. At uh, Zoom, they have uh, uh, they have an option to switch on or switch off uh, closed captioning. That is uh, the way we are speaking. We can have the subtitling uh, at uh, at the lower uh, channel uh, where, where, where we see the mute and the stop, we can have subtitling. Individually, uh, names come up, and we, we have that kind of uh, facility in Zoom, whereas other platforms don't have it. Uh, I, I have been researching that. I have also uh, taken up uh, uh, research on uh, uh, YouTube. So YouTube also has uh, uh, the, the subtitling or closed captioning uh, uh, with them. So the way it works here, it doesn't work elsewhere. So I, I am very proud of the fact that we have a platform that, that is available to deaf people, integrated with uh, uh, voice and uh, subtitles, uh, video and subtitles. Uh, I think, Sharmila, you brought up uh, a good point out here that uh, you know, when we when it comes to technology, there are features available. The problem is, uh, problem happens in terms of usage and applications of it. We don't even know most of the times. And that is where uh, probably at uh, Bringle platform, we can kind of use all these features. And with your expertise, we kind of bring in and integrate that and make it more user friendly. So that more and more people can take the benefits of that because not everybody can kind of research out and bring those aspects, uh, you know, from that. They might be using a Zoom facility only to have a video conference, but there are much more beyond that. There are many more uh, issues which can start coming in and uh, you know, from, from that perspective. So I think it's a collective approach and the thought process which is there, which is working out as a better platform with Bringer. Uh, so thanks for that, uh, Sharmila. I think we have two questions, one from Devaspati Bhatt and one from Lavanya. Uh, yes. OK. So it is, uh, so uh, Sharmila, this question is, I'm just unmuting uh, okay. all of, you know, right. allowing everybody to unmute themselves. Uh, Lavanya, can you please unmute yourself and uh, ask yeah, a I, question? I, I actually didn't have a question as much as I wanted to be able to bring, you know, this uh, aspect into, you know, uh, focus that now when we were looking at, uh, you know, uh, lean thinking and as Sharmila was uh, posing this aspect about uh, the economics of, you know, uh, of the processes. So we, of course, so when we're looking at something which is unorthodox or which is not normal or which is not already acceptable in the, in the, in the system, it is going to mean a little financial investment to be able to bring it into a system, in my opinion. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't know, Sharmila, if you agree or not, but we, for one, we have a building construction company and where we are uh, encouraging young engineers into understanding and getting trained into using sustainable alternative practices of construction. 
No, this is not something that is done and neither are they educated in this system or nor are they familiar with it. So mistakes are going to occur and it is already taken for granted that their errors or their mistakes is what is going to cost the company and they hopefully we're going to be able to intervene at the right time to be, you know, shorten the process. Uh, yes. So yeah, Lavanya, what you mentioned, actually, I think there is a question from Devaspati uh, on the same grounds. Uh, and he, he is asking where will mistake proofing, uh, which is called as Poka UK in, okay. uh, in Lean, uh, will get fit and how important it is. Uh, John, would you want to uh, answer that? Uh, thank you. Uh, this, there was one in very interesting uh, story I saw, again, with the coronavirus. So there was a gentleman in Europe, it was either Italy or Spain. So he heard that there's this one meter distance rule, right? And uh, he physically made a cardboard circle, one meter radius, cut it out and put it on top of him so that the circle was around his whole body. And he walked into the store and people were looking at him like he's crazy. And they're asking him, what are you doing? He says, they, they say we have to stay one meter away. This is how I'm making sure we're one meter away. So people <laughs> physically couldn't actually come one meter towards him because they would hit the cardboard that he put around himself. <laughs> so again, another really wonderful little example of a pokeyoki device. Um, and I was at a conference uh, in Bulgaria last year. We had a, it was a young programmer. He was literally, I think, 22 years old. Um, and his whole speech was on uh, how do you do pokeyoki in the digital space? Going back to what I mentioned, lean digital, because he was saying there's so many errors in coding um, that people usually don't worry about because, well, you just get another coder and you just spend more time on it. So what he was doing was um, very almost scientifically going through the process of coding. To, how do you make sure that coding is done right the first time, every time? Because like you mentioned, um, inspection, even programming inspection is, uh, is a waste. So uh, anybody that's interested in you know, having better quality, reducing waste, doing things better for the customer, uh, Pokeyoki is the way to go. Absolutely, uh, John. And I think, uh, Kuldeep, you want to add something on this with some uh, specific examples? Um, well, examples in the sense, it's, it's more about what we call it as foolproofing or mistake proofing. It's typically also known as foolproofing, F-O-O-L. So any fool should not be able to make a mistake uh, or get into it. Uh, Very nice. One, one uh, it, it's quite some time back, I remember as an example, like uh, before those uh, car lockings came in with the remote, uh, people used to have a problem of leaving the keys inside the car and lock the car. The, the front doors where the driver and the co-driver, it used to be, they could have, they can open the door, the keys could remain inside, but by pressing the, the lock and it used to get locked and the keys were inside and it happened quite a few times. And at that point of time, uh, when I was buying a car uh, as well, uh, uh, replacing my existing car, and I, I went into one uh, of the manufacturer showroom and he pointed out as their uh, how they are preventing that failure that if the doors are open, it can't be locked from out, uh, from inside. So, so that you don't forget the keys inside and you have to call somebody to open your car and which actually can also result into, uh, you know, carjacking or you, your car being stolen or so on. So, mistake proofing or uh, poka yoka or full proofing is, is an important aspect of uh, prevention. It, it's more about defect prevention activity. And the more we do that, and, and I, I come back to, again, the definition of processes. Once we define the processes, we identify potential failure. And how do we ensure prevention of those failures or defects? And that is the importance, again, the value stream mapping or the process definitions come, come into picture. And 
that that is how you know you can uh, do the mistake proofing so and if if an un person who is not aware of your product and what ways the, the products can get failed if those are taken care of naturally like even if you look at your washing machines today especially the automatic washing machines you can't open the doors uh, when they are in operation and and that that's mistake proofing or fool proofing in terms of so that you don't enter and have an accident by just accidentally even opening the uh, washing machine door whereas the semi automatic machine you could do everything you could open the lid you could put more clothes remove existing clothes whatever wanted was possible on that okay. so oh, technology is the, the is definitely helping in doing that uh, plus uh, design as well as processing process definitions will also help in doing uh, full proof very right very right i think you have uh, given a very uh, you know very good example of a local household from a from a washing machine perspective i also would like to you know actually uh, share a very simple thing which everybody would immediately understand of a example of a poka yuk so everybody uses computer right at least for opening up a word document or uh, opening up a computer or shutting down or putting it something like that there is a message comes onto your screen whenever you try to close something so you say would you want to shut it down yes or no would you want to close it down yes or no that is actually the best example of poka yoga it is actually giving you a warning sign saying that you still check whether you want to really perform that action or not so it is giving you an opportunity to do that so there are three levels of poka yoga which happens into an organization in any uh, processes the one aspect which happens is it just gives you a message that yes there is something which can go wrong if you do something like this but the system will allow you to pass through it will not hamper your actions the second action second step which happens in a poka uk wherein it gives you a warning it stops your action to perform further which i explained it with the example of yes and no the third aspect which happens wherein it will not even allow you to move forward whatever you do typically in large uh, manufacturing organization where there is a large there are chances of explosions and all if you do something wrong so there are set controls which they put up at the back end so whatever you do it will not allow you to do that one very good example is that you cannot plug your can you, you know we cannot plug a us uh, socket into an indian socket that is a example of a poka yoga you cannot do that the floppy disk the usb connection all of those are that unless you have a best fitment of that you cannot insert anything into it you may damage it but it will not get into this that's the final aspect of uh, this which works out and uh, i think uh, we have actually extended our session today and i just couldn't stop myself uh, for, from such a intense discussion uh, at this uh, you know for for today of this and actually it's one of my core subjects so it's it's very touchy to me to talk about it but thank you uh, john thanks kuldeep for your precious time in spending this long uh, one one and a half hours with us in fact it's almost like 95 minutes uh, and then uh, you know sharing wonderful insights on lean uh, uh, lean methodology waste elimination various aspects of it i would also want to thank uh, radio masti 24 by 7 singapore uh, who are public who are airing daily uh, you know our pulse of wisdom of various speakers who are coming on our daily show every day on their channel the radio masti uh, 24 by 7 you can download or you can uh, listen to that there by downloading their mobile application both on android and uh, the ios they are the only uh, you know hindi speaking radio channel in southeast asia so uh, while there will be lot there will be all of those airing will be in english so because it will be a global audience and uh, so do watch that uh, over there as well do not miss out uh, on that uh, i also would like to thank specifically uh, rajshri who has been kind of uh, supporting us for you know uh, speaking to all the speakers and coordinating sending them messages connecting them and uh, what good work which she is doing with uh, purnam foundation on gender neutrality uh i would like to thank charu for uh, also you know making this entire 
show taking it to the entire globe, uh, connecting the various experts, and her uh, she herself being a very uh, you know good influencer and a founder of WomenLines.com uh, magazine, an online magazine which is doing wonders all across the globe. Uh, I would want to thank Mani for uh, designing this specific program, DYU, Design Your Unicorn, and being part of this initiative of 21 Days Business Sustainability Challenge. And of course, Mani, your, uh, your, your efforts with the startups is really, really commendable. And we would want to help many more businesses and startups all across the globe. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Sharmila, who comes in, uh, who has been there with uh, me thick, in thick and thin times for last three years now, uh, is working as a co-founder of Bringle and CEO of Bringle. She's also managing the CSR wing of uh, Bringle, which is Vardhan, and she's a managing director for the same. She takes care of a lot of uh, aspects on disability around that. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Simran, who has always been supporting us from the back end, managing the platform, supporting us, coordinating and things on, on to that. And Divya, who has been uh, very supportively in, you know, passing on the messages, spreading the Bringle dream wave. And Shuchi. Shuchi, is, uh, I think, had to leave today, uh, but she's always been there on the social media, supporting this initiative, forwarding this initiative, talking about it. So Divya and Shuchi, thanks to you specifically for uh, making this uh, initiative going across the globe and bringing, attaching more and more people. So uh, that's something which, uh, you know, it's a very core team which we are working and uh, we are getting good and good support. Uh, I would want to request Rajshree to kind of talk about the pulse of wisdom and money if you have captured uh, from today's discussion. Okay. Um... Again, today there were so many aggravations, so many, you know, definitions. It was almost like I had a crash course on process six in my league. I think that's a that's a one thing wonderful thing happened. Uh, thanks, Anshak. Um, what is uh, John spoke about? What is lean? Uh, uh, you know, uh, technology. It is a it is a focus on customer value and uh, how to increase the customer value uh, that is and uh, waste elimination this is what he spoke about uh, and he also highly talked about how lean focuses more on management system strategy process uh, leadership people so it cut, cuts across the entire you know business uh, you know business uh, level that we have and uh, he gave about the toyota example the toyota book uh, which originally it was written for the for the manufacturing uh, you know the four uh, the segment what they had and how it changed to toyota way to service excellence i've seen this you know all of you spoke a lot about uh, japanese uh, and i worked with japanese company for two years and i being the hr head there it's not only at the operations level, even in the HR, you know, we were supposed to follow everything. And that is where I learned that it's the, the process that, you know, everybody's talking about. It's not, you know, the operations customer. It it, it goes everywhere and working with uh, and our bosses for Japanese. So it was a different experience. So I can understand how in depth it, it goes. Uh, then coming to the... Um, Coming to Kulbeep, sir, you talked about, uh, uh, you know, there were a lot of anecdotes you gave. And uh, you talked about uh, uh, transportation, innovation, machine waste. There was a, I could not, I'm going to talk to you and take all the, you know, anecdotes that you have given because those are important. I was not able to capture everything still I have captured so that I we will be able to circulate for our audience later. It was a uh, Tim Wood that you spoke about. Uh, you highly talked about how now the waste of uh, you know talent is is becoming more uh, more uh, you know uh, focus is more on that and which uh, from a HR point of view I can say that yes uh, that is something very very important and uh, if it can be put put to use you know a lot of a lot of creativity can flow which will lead to innovation and productivity. Because your process is somewhere at the, you know, at, it starts with the creativity and it comes from the human, you know, talent and human potential. Uh, you all 
also talked about um, how customers what they want is is something everything early and on time in on time in full error free that's what you mentioned and this is so apt today that there is no time you have to give everything on time uh you in other discussions that we had uh you talk about how how the lean uh, model is not the technology it's a, it's a habit it's a system it's a culture it is an integral part of the organization so focus should be not project wise but it has to be a part of the organization it has to be a culture of the organization and it is a continuous uh, improvement that should happen uh you referred about covid example problem solving approach and uh, how the process is you know discussed as a document uh, and only process is effective when it is implemented or it is put in use so even if it is not documented but it is implemented so the myth that you talked about was wonderful and uh, when i was working with otis elevator i had changed their 40 year old policy document and i remember without documentation they were doing fantastic things so this is where i could relate that when i changed everything i changed to undocumented process which were in place so that is a wonderful point uh, you came up and i like the full proofing and mistake proofing that is a fool full proofing so that is why i said sir i'm going to sit with you and collect uh, all the abbreviation that you spoke um Balas uh, spoke about uh, lean is a culture and six sigma is an intervention. His Wipro experience and uh, how the you know the the map the he the the manufacturing you know model was transitioned over to the service industry, especially IT, which was a that time was a, uh, a new age industry. Uh, Money, fantastic! Uh, your uh, unicorn, I think. Uh, every time I hear and every time I listen from you and Anshu, I feel that. Oh wow! This is such a wonderful, you know, project. It's, there is a lot of uh, value that you have added to that. And one value you talked about is that uh, when you do all these uh, process-related any, you know, interventions, you forget the business model, and that is so important. So you said that all along your process uh, journey, the business model has to model has to be kept in mind, and which creates the this which is the differentiator. What you talk about in your unicorn, you know. uh the strategy that you have built i'm so sure i think i should not talk about you because you have got so much of knowledge i am not, i'm not able to absorb so much i need some more time but <laughs> basically you are telling me whatever i have said is of no value <laughs> <laughs> no i i think in I'm my next kidding. session I'm just in, in next <laughs> in, in next session i'm going to start teaching whatever you have said <laughs> but uh, you uh, simplified a lot of methods you simplified by giving examples from the day to day life i think it made it, it made easy and about john also talked about visual control and uh, how visual control works how visual i didn't know this is called visual control it's, it's a wonderful thing that we do it we do it everywhere and we see it but uh, see how you know beautifully it is defined and uh, sharmila thanks for bringing out the disability aspect i think india is yet to go long way in terms of uh, you know giving due respect to this area we have to give we talk a lot about uh, uh, disability we talk about uh, uh, everything but i think india has to do a lot and uh, i think that time will come you always say that government takes time i think with this lot of changes that are coming this aspect will also uh, be changed so yes uh, rajesh ji it's it is uh, time that we address this yes. and the government is indeed serious on this very good i, I know that for sure fantastic but, fantastic. but the thing is uh, 20 years back uh, when i was in canada i had a uh, wheelchair in the bus you know one of my peers was uh, in a wheelchair then he got onto the bus wow. in in the wheelchair okay. today also we don't have low floor buses where i can push the wheelchair or the wheelchair user can go into the bus himself Or herself. Yes. So, uh, 
very small things, but they don't happen. Uh, 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 I just talk for the mechanized chair. It's three lakhs per share. A business can uh, buy it, yeah. but a household can't. Agree, agree. So, uh, if it is, is thirty thousand, I think the uh, uh, entire uh, scene would change today. Thanks. I can I can very well you know understand what you are from where you are coming. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Money you can add if you want. Otherwise, I am uh, done with my today's call to wisdom. I really like the word crash course, Rashri, because this has been really a crash course. And yes. I'm so grateful to our speakers for yes. such this a This speaker was so fantastic. Awesome. Thank you yes. so yes. much to everybody. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Mani? Uh, no, I haven't captured anything. Uh, I was actually immersed in listening to all the speakers. Wow. It was very well done. Yeah. Mani is trying to be modest now. <laughs> Mani is trying to be nice with me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's put it that way. That's okay. Right. <laughs> so, thanks, Mani. <laughs> but anyways, I think uh, thanks everybody. And uh, Rachvi, you have very well said, and Charu, you have acknowledged it's a crash course. The purpose of this 21 days uh, business sustainability challenge is to give a people a entire perspective of four pillars okay. and 21 days and probably the hundred steps by which they can definitely sustain their businesses. And there are various components of it. It is not necessary that every business, you know, if you're survive, if you're struggling today, if you are having, if you're not having a, uh, you know, business continuity planning, if you don't have a plan B, plan C, plan D, you don't know your customer, you don't have the right experiences being set up. These are all various aspects. Now, how do you structure that into a step-by-step -step approach? Is what Design Your Unicorn project does. That is what that program does it. So while this crash course will definitely help people to help themselves, whatever they can, and, you know, ultimately achieve their, uh, you know, reach to that sustainability space. But yes, there would be a detailed program, which is already available with Bringle. You can definitely go to, uh, you know, uh, in the community of Designer Unicorn and actually, you know, submit on that. I would also want to request and invite few businesses who have utilized this crash course to make some changes in their businesses. If you can come up with those inspiring stories, we would be want to you know, bring you on board and share your story to the entire world. So uh, apart from that, there is another live pitching week which is happening starting from 27th of April. So please log on to Bringle Academy community page, bringleacademy.com slash course slash business sustainability and upload your pitch deck for the live pitching week to our cross border investors. Uh, with this, I would like to thank everybody, whoever is present uh, here, along with my team. Thank you so much, and keep bringing, keep growing. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Have, have, have a good thank night. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.